My name is Jonathan Almfjord, and this is In-Depth Conversations. Okay. Hello and welcome to In-Depth Conversations and another episode of our PhD student series. Uh, today we have a very interesting guest named Simon Grandius. Uh, Simon is a PhD student in Cognitive Science here at Lund University. So let's jump right into it. Uh, what do you do as your research projects, Simon? As I studied the, the thinking of uh, reptiles, uh, essentially the cognition of reptiles, mostly uh, lizards and tortoises, uh, and hopefully in the future also uh, the tuatara, which is its own branch. Maybe we can go into that later. Okay. okay. But uh, uh, before that, I've also done a lot of stuff with uh, uh, alligators and uh, birds, especially so-called more basal birds. Like basal pal- birds. Like uh, they're seen as more sort of cognitively simple. Although ah, that's up right. to that's a that's an open question, I suppose. Okay, so, m- maybe a controversial question. Right, maybe. Yeah. So like okay. uh, they're like ostriches, I suppose, and hmm? uh, emus and these types of animals. Uh, okay. So I've done okay. some work with those. Uh, so that's basically what I do. Okay. Trying to like look at the really broad perspective, or or at least uh, contribute to the broad perspective. I don't only do that, or like mm. I'm not the only one who does that. Of course, it's like my whole. Uh, Research group basically does these things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I contribute in my way All to right. these very grand evolutionary perspectives on the evolution of cognition. Okay, okay. Yeah, cool subjects for sure. Uh, so I'm thinking, why don't you tell us about uh, your academic background? Where did you start? Um, did you always know that you were becoming an oh, no. academic? I had uh, I'd pretty marginal interest in animals. Like it wasn't mm. really a thing that I cared about that much. Um, like uh, it's interesting to see like documentaries or whatever like pet a cat but it's uh, mm. not a big interest for me at all uh, it's like started with uh, just studying philosophy theoretical philosophy where I was yeah. very interested in I suppose philosophy of mind but also uh, the philosophy of language and then I went into English later uh, studying English uh, mm. particular with the linguistic aspect and then uh, then I went into eventually cognitive science and then when I started cognitive science, I sort of looked up what sort of things do they do. Mm. And the main things that like, oh, I'm doing this program, this master's program, the main things I would like to do is maybe like uh, more language focused things, or if not that, mm. at least work with humans or like robotics, these things. And then like at the bottom of the list, mm. it's like all oh, the, the animal stuff, it's like, no, that <laughs> seems complicated. I'm not really interested in that, whatever. So it was a complete uh, like side, I got completely sidelined by uh, that, uh, type of research. Uh, mm. It started with, uh, they uh, highlighted a position where you could sort of volunteer work with yeah. American alligators. Uh, Stefan Reber did this um, things, do, does, still do, does a lot of things with uh, American alligators. So it's like, okay, we need assistance mm. to help. So like, sure, I can do that once. It's like, uh, you have to get the opportunity to work anything with an alligator in Sweden. It's like, all right, I can do that. It's like, uh, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't a thing that I wanted to do long term. And then when I did that work, uh, it was like very eye-opening to see how much there goes on in like alligator thinking or yeah. in the alligator brain in that way. Mm. So you don't think of it uh, as a very thinking animal. It's like you see them in documentaries and there's mm. sort of just cold nothing behind the eyes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever. But right. then you start working with them. It's like, oh no, there's so much personality, there's so much emo- mm. uh, emotion, mm. there's so much uh, thinking and... Uh, uh, stuff going on in alligators and when it's like okay do you want to come next week it's like sure and then i was yeah. like, keep coming each week <laughs> okay and then, uh, now by the way come to where to, this, this was at uh, an alligator facility that they built yeah uh, at this point outside Vinslov. ah okay so many interesting things happened at yeah. Vinslov, <laughs> i guess um mm. so there they had the alligator facility and then now we have moved uh the alligators from this pretty small facility to East IU Park, the East Zoo. Right, right, so, uh, I remember now, yeah. So it's like open to anybody to come to East Zoo and look mm, at the alligators. Mm. And then we have um, a research room where we, just, uh, we do the mm, experiments mm. on alligators at the moment. Um, mm. Cool, so, so you got some first-hand experience with a couple of alligators. Is it like one or two? I think I've been there actually, but I don't remember too much. Is it like two alligators or 20 or how many? We, we have six alligators. Okay, uh, we have yeah. two males and two females. 
Mm. I think the age, I don't know if they know the exact age, but mm. it covers around maybe 10 years. Okay. Maybe above. Okay. Um, but they are like recently like left the juvenile state, I suppose. Uh, mm. And mm. started to become like sexually active and things like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Around six of them. And I, uh, I assume it has to be a rather special facility in order to, to give these animals what they need to stay alive. I mean, the temperature and the humidity and all those things. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. at the moment we tend to hover around maybe 28 degrees in the air. Yeah, yeah, it's right. very humid. And the water should probably be hotter, but I think it's at the moment like, really, like around 24 degrees and things like this. Mm, mm. Uh, so yeah, it tends to be that yeah, if you come there, you have to be dressed appropriately and have always water yeah. ready. Uh, it's not quite as bad in this facility, but the old one mm. it used to be super, super hot and very humid. So I would have to use these uh, like dehydrating things in uh, mm. the cold, the things you get at the pharmacy, to like get salt levels. That's yeah, the water yeah. When you just right. keep drinking constantly. Right. Uh, yes. And obviously, like to, if you were to get dehydrated uh, while working with a dangerous animal, like they're not as dangerous as people think, mm. Mm. but they will bite you if you let them. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, it's not ideal mm -hmm. if you start to get dizzy or faint. Yeah. Like yeah. you work with them very closely. It's a, not a mm. like hands off approach. It's a very hands on uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thing that we do with them. I could imagine some kind of simple research project. Will this animal bite me? And you have the hand like 10 centimeters, 9 centimeters, and now he bites. Okay, check. Right. Um, <laughs> but why don't you tell me about some specific research projects? Because everything that you say about alligators is awesome and funny. But specifically, what, what's, um, uh, what's some kind of uh, hypothesis that you could try, uh, etc.? So, so the idea is that uh, we want to look at the evolution, yeah. right? And uh, one way one can do is like look at fossils and stuff. But behavior and well, behavior definitely doesn't fossilize. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to sort of extract information about it indirectly. And uh, you could also look at brains, but brains also, soft tissue doesn't really fossilize. Yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, the, the one strategy of looking at this is to do what's called extant phylogenetic bracketing. So okay. extant is supposed to extinct, so they live. Mm, uh, mm. And phylogenetic, that's like the tree of life. So you, for example, if you look at alligators and you look at birds, uh, they bracket the extinct dinosaurs in the tree of life, if that makes sense. Mm, so you have... Mm. If you, it's hard to, it would be nice to have like a picture or whatever. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. You have like a branching path. Okay, okay. This is the archosaur path. And then one mm. goes to the crocodilians eventually. Another yeah. one goes to the birds. And then sort of in between, uh, you have non-avian dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs, mm, mm. but they're avian dinosaurs. And okay, then you okay. have this mm. other branch. So like, let's say we want to know what happened with these dinosaurs. We can sort of look at, okay, what do birds do? And what do alligators do? Yeah, yeah. And if they... If you find similar abilities, then you could maybe assess, you could do like an educated guess, a very good educated guess that maybe this is something that existed in their common ancestors. Yeah, right, right. Uh, mm. Whereas if, okay, you have it in birds, we don't have it in alligators, then maybe it didn't appear in the common ancestors, it maybe appear later in the line down mm -hmm, towards mm -hmm. birds. Or so this is the sort of things we do. Mm, so mm. Uh, initially then they did this huge experimental battery that looked at archosaurs. Archosaurs are birds plus crocodilians okay. uh, of the ones that are still living. Uh, so you looked at object permanence. So you place food behind the barrier and do they know that this food right. still exists? Yeah. Uh, or I've heard a discussion uh, in uh, human babies. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's here's a, mommy, here's daddy. <laughs> it's, it's based on uh, PAJ. Uh, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. It is, it is based on those. Psychologists, stuff. right? Yeah, 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 for sure. It's that, but applied to animals. Mm, mm. Uh, as well as uh, like motor self-regulation or uh, inhibitions. You place a transparent barrier in front of them mm, and then you mm. have food behind. So will it keep bouncing into yeah. the barrier, let's say? Uh, there's also one... Uh, which is a novel thing that sort of mixes the two mm. that has gone through a bunch of different names, but it's a, I think at the moment it's called, they call it cognitive self-regulation. It doesn't matter what it's called. Cognitive self-regulation. It okay. doesn't matter. They're going to probably switch names. Yep. It's okay. a weird one. But uh, anyway, the idea then is that you sort of mix the two. So you have, uh, for example, the opaque barrier in the object permanence task, and you have yes. the transparent barrier. So you have two choices. Uh, and then let's say that the animal has a preferred and non-preferred food. So then you place the preferred food behind the opaque barrier mm -hmm. and the non-preferred behind the transparent barrier. So as mm -hmm. the alligator goes into the task, you constantly get the visual information that, oh, here's food. 
mm. but they also saw the way you do it is you open the barriers and then they go in and then you close them down right so they see okay they saw for a second that there was a like really good food on the other side and then you hide the good food yeah. and they still see the worst food but they will take mm. the worst food mm. and there's like okay will they still go for the the better food or will they sort of get pulled by the least preferred food yeah and what's yeah. interesting for example with alligators is that when you look at the there's just a transparent barrier like will they hit the barrier before they go around they're awful at that one <laughs> but they're not awful at the more complicated one okay for example. and uh, hmm. it's not clear exactly why that would be for example hmm. Hmm. and so yeah, then you have this battery with a bunch of other tests in addition to this and you test alligators and you test many different birds and then yeah. hopefully you can then do these grand comparisons like okay how do they stack up yeah and what yeah. and what i do at the moment like my the perhaps at the moment the big focus of my research is that i want to then expand that to the other reptiles so the turtles and tortoises and lizards mm. and the fifth branch of reptiles which is the runocephalia which is only one living species oh okay uh, <laughs> Uh, the tuatara, which lives, lives outside in New Zealand, or in certain places like in New mm -hmm, Zealand, mm -hmm. only there, only one species. Uh, so that's the idea, to mm -hmm. do these very grand comparisons. Okay, so I think I understand, um, I forgot the term for it, but if you have the tree of species, I suppose, and you yeah. do research on that one and that one, then you can... You call it extrapolate? No, that's the wrong word. <laughs> but okay. like, uh, um, I don't have a biology uh, like background or paleontology. Okay, background. okay, okay. So yeah. I'll probably also butcher you a lot of these. Trace stuff. it back to, to a yeah. common ancestor. Yeah, to a common ancestor. Yes, <laughs> yes, I understand that. Uh, I think this is super cool, but I kind of wonder if you could motivate. Why is this research? Well, honestly, wh why should it get uh, public tax funding? Why is it relevant for the larger society? I mean, not everyone thinks crocodilians and dinosaurs and birds are interesting. So, right. So, so why, why is it? <laughs> well, I think, uh, well, I think they should start to update their taste. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all. But regardless, <laughs> um, I, uh, well, one basic thing you can say is that because we do this research in a group of animals that are generally neglected, uh, mm, mm. you get a lot of information about uh, that's relevant for, for example like conservation or I don't know, wildlife management and all these things yeah, um, yeah. so I think for when it comes to sort of thinking about ecology and wildlife it's like it seems to have a very basic uh, applications there but uh, I also have uh, the hope that it would have a bigger impact on like cognition as a whole so mm. cognition obviously has a very wide ranging like applicability, like cognitive disorders or mm. like decision making, economic decision making, or I don't know, like AI boost, all of these things, like the big uh, AI hype at the moment, for example, it's like all mm. very relevant mm. to cognition. And I think yeah. uh, that uh, to take an evolutionary perspective to cognition has, I think it has a big potential to elucidate a thing, uh, like a lot of things that you might not get if you only look at humans mm. or if you only look at evolution that is very like uh like limited in time let's say like this mm, okay. the, the short time scales yeah um also a, a, a general approach that we take and it is a more common it's, it's an approach that becomes more and more common which is to instead of taking the human as okay we start with the human and then we go from the human move ourselves back to sort of yeah. elucidate uh cognition we always have like the human as the apex. Instead, we look at sort of, well, look at basic biological principles, let's say, like start with mm, biology mm. and then try to look at it in a holistic way, I suppose. So like the whole, the whole tree of life, let's say. Mm, and mm. let's start with these perspectives. And then maybe you can look at the, how the human fits into this, but it's not something that is human focused. Mm, uh, mm. So the hope is then yeah. that maybe this will elucidate something about cognition, you know. I mean, the time will tell, I suppose. But uh, yeah, yeah. That would be the hope. So then you would have, you would essentially inherit all these potential benefits of understanding cognition better. Mm, mm. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, and of course, I agree. Uh, I think it's a really cool uh, field of research. Um, I'm thinking, could you do like a, a 
10 second pitch like if you meet the person at a party what what do you do for a living basically okay i research you might say you research what do you go like yeah crocodilians ha 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 or can you do like um do you usually go to the to the uh, evolutionary stuff or do you how do you sell your idea if you are to pitch it um at the party i'm probably pretty bad at selling okay. other than other than the fact that like I feel like when I bring up that you work with Crocs and stuff, mm. they do get excited. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, they do, they do. Mm. But uh, I guess I would say that uh, um, the party pitch, I guess, generally is that I sort of play with animals in a non-invasive way, ah, whatever. Yeah, and then yeah. I happen to get this information, mm. and then we understand how cognition not only works, but maybe how it emerges yeah, through yeah. evolution. Right. And I think that people generally are curious about, like, why, why does thinking, why is thinking a thing? Mm, or, mm. like, what, what purpose does it serve? Yeah, yeah. And to try to think about it through how it emerges. I think people tend to be interested in that. Yeah. I actually really, really like what you said. That you play with animals in a non-invasive way. Um, and it seems to make sense. I know a lot of... Um, well, scientists and researchers who would never say, for my research, I play <laughs> with stuff, or maybe yeah. I play with ideas, I suppose. But yeah, that's more abstract in a way. But you play with animals, and then you happen to get some, some information that you can use later on. Yeah, it's, mm. it's not uh, proven, but the thing that we sort of uh, notice when we work with them is that it's uh, essentially enrichment that we do. Mm, mm. So. Uh, like uh, if you're a keeper uh, at a zoo, yeah. like you you obviously want to give all the time you can to all your animals, whatever. Mm, mm. But it's, you only have so much time, and you have a lot of animals. Uh, so in a sense, we almost uh, it's like a complement uh, complementary like relationship with mm, uh, the mm. zoos in that we can help, uh, like do stuff that makes the life better for the animals and more more interesting, whatever. Mm, uh, mm. It's also because we work with them so closely. We can sometimes, there's been a case, for example, where we noticed that one of the animals, uh, the tortoise had hurt its leg. And yeah, it was, uh, right, right. And it was hiding. Mm. And it's, uh, so it's like, oh, this one just hides. Uh, it's hard to tell if you don't work with them very closely. Mm. And even I, mm. as I work with them, I did, it took me a long time before I realized, oh, it's uh, the leg is hurt. Yeah. And so that's like yeah. a way in which uh, uh, the well-being of the animals is uh, like enhanced by mm. us working mm. with them. And then, as a bonus, like the, what we get back is that we can get also data to try to understand these animals more mm, and understand mm. uh, cognition more. Yeah, uh, yeah, I see. Um, I was thinking, uh, you told me something uh, uh, before we started filming about uh, some travels that you had going on. Has it been the case that you have traveled to, you mentioned a very rare species, for example, that only lived in, I'm sorry, I forgot. New Zealand. Was. Yeah, yeah. Are. Has that been a case, oh, we have to travel there and, and build up this experimentation uh, environment in order to get... The we want to do that. The yeah. thing with Dutora is that they're, uh, they're not uh, like threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, they're least concerned in uh, how you think of those things. But they're super rare when it comes okay. to zoos or whatever. Like okay. in uh, Europe, there's two zoos that have a few. Mm. Uh, and the idea is that we would like to work with them because they're very understudied. It's like, uh, if you think about the the living reptiles you have like the big branches like the birds and crocodilians and yeah. turtles and tortoises yeah. and then lizards and then you have a fifth one that is like at the level of this one mm -hmm. but it's you don't you haven't heard of that one mm -hmm. which is uh, the rhinocephalia which has this one species that is lives uh mm. or southern new zealand and uh, it's like it looks like a lizard but it's not a lizard okay. and supposedly it has all these uh, things that are more like maybe the common ancestors of even uh, reptiles and humans, let's say, but mm, we don't really mm. know. And then if you look at, okay, what do we know about the Tuatara? And there's like essentially nothing, especially with, when it comes to how they think and do decisions. Mm, it's like mm. uh, only one paper ever that's been done on the Tuatara, which only is sort of like some visual discrimination task. It's the only thing that's been done. Okay, okay. Uh, so it'd be super, super exciting to like travel to work with these. But, yeah, but yeah. people hold on to them with good reason. Yeah, I see. I so see. it's very hard to collab or to create these collaborations. But that would definitely mm. be a goal. That's a, uh, one of the big, maybe the prime goal, in fact. One of the prime mm. goals of my PhD, I would say. Oh. 
In fact, when, uh, when I uh, applied for another PhD in uh, Vienna, one of the sort of interview questions they had with me is like, okay, yes, mm. the, if you have infinite resources and infinite money, whatever, like, what will you do? Yeah. And I sort of used it as a creative exercise and said all these super unreasonable things. Mm. And then one of them was like, oh, yeah, we'll work with the Twitter or whatever. And then towards the end, it was like, you're going to work with the Twitter? Good. Mm. <laughs> good, luck, good luck working with the Twitter. That's not going to yeah. happen. <laughs> so like, yeah, it's always been this thing in my back of my mind. It's like, I'm gonna work with it till tomorrow. Yeah, I swear. that's so cool. Yeah, that's anyway. a specific goal in mind. <laughs> yes. But they also because they are so interesting and that we know so little about them. It's like, yeah, um, yeah. Extremely fascinating animal. Yeah, uh, I usually end these talks with a, with a brief question. How do you think um, uh, your everyday life as a PhD student aligns with what you thought it was going to be like before you became a PhD student. Is it the same or is it very different? Is it more fun? I hope you say it is more fun or is it less fun? What's your experience? Um, since I sort of started with the volunteer work with the alligators a lot, and yeah, then right. in between the PhD uh, and the master's program, I also did like a, as a re I worked as a research assistant for one. Mm, mm. So I kind of assumed that, oh, it's just kind of be the same, uh, but maybe more focused on my own stuff. Uh, and more stressful and mm. that's kind of how it is i guess okay more stressful okay. but also more fun you know? okay okay but that's uh yeah, yeah i guess that's uh, my expectations yeah yeah okay i'm so glad you said it was more fun okay awesome <laughs> yes that's uh, a great way to to uh, stop this talk okay thank you so much simon for thank coming you. to visit us cheers